Greece is unique in the maritime world. Nowhere else is there such a great concentration of shipping companies. To support our Greek customers, we have decided to offer a full service portfolio from the Paris office by strengthening the capabilities, the skills and the knowledge of the people here. At home in Greece, at home around the world, with DNV. I am Nicolas Bornois of Capital Inc. and I would like to welcome you all to today's podcast. This pod podcast today is part of the series Riding the Waves of a Lifetime. And this series gives us the opportunity to discuss with major maritime industry personalities who share with us career and life experiences as well as their insight on the industry's direction, opportunities and challenges. I would like to thank DNV for sponsoring today's podcast. As you have seen, DNV has made a major commitment to Greece and is celebrating 100 years of presence in the Greek market. So thank you, DNV, for uh, your commitment to Greece and for, among other, and also for sponsoring today's uh, podcast. Today, we have the opportunity to discuss with Dr. Nicholas P. Panayotis Tsakos, one of the most influential and outspoken industry leaders. Nikos has been included in the Lloyd's list of 100 most influential people in shipping every year since 2012. And by the way, I'm delighted to say that we are recording this podcast today uh, in New York. Dr. Tsakos uh, arrived in New York a few days ago to receive uh, an award. He has been inducted in the Hall of Fame of, in the International Hall of Fame of the Maritime Association of New York and New Jersey. Uh, another major accomplishment and uh, recognition for Dr. Tsakos. So I have to say that besides, uh, of course, being very happy to be part of that uh, award ceremony, it was the very first time in the last two years that I had the opportunity to be uh, part of an event of 400 people. Uh, so that was a very positive sign that we are returning uh, to uh, normality. So um, I will continue uh, briefly about Dr. Tsakos. Uh, he comes from a traditional Hian seafaring family. He has been involved in the maritime industry since the early 80s and has spent considerable time at sea learning the nuts and bolts of business from the front line. Now, focusing on his business achievements, Dr. Tsakos is the founder, president, and CEO of the New York Stock Exchange listed Tsakos Energy Navigation, a pioneering shipping company and one of the largest independent transporters of energy in the world. He founded the company in 1993. He listed it at the uh, uh, Oslo Stock Exchange at the time and uh, with a fleet of uh, four vessels. In 2002, 10 got listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and it has been the longest listed shipping company in the US capital markets. Today, celebrating 28 years as a public company, 10 has grown from an initial fleet of four vessels, as I mentioned, to a modern state-of-the-art diversified fleet of 72 vessels. An enviable track record of continuous growth and also of uninterrupted dividend payments to shareholders, regardless of market cycles. Now, in addition to them, the Tsakos Group manages a diversified fleet in excess of 100 vessels, spread across the tanker, LNG, dry bulk, and container segments, with an increased focus to renewable energy investments. Now, besides being a major ship owner, Dr. Tsakos is a statesman for the industry with a larger institutional footprint on the maritime industry's direction. He served as chairman of Intertanko, the Independent Tanker Owners Association for a period of four years between 2014 and 2018, being elected for two successive two-year terms. Also, uh, between 2000 and 2006, he was the chairman of the groundbreaking maritime environmental organization, Helmepa, 
And uh, of course, Nikos is uh, part of a number of organizations. And needless to say, he has received uh, numerous uh, distinctions and awards. I'd like to mention that in 2011, he received his doctorate degree from the City University of London for his pioneering work in the equity financial markets related to shipping companies. Now, last but not least, in addition to his business endeavors, Dr. Tsakos is very active in supporting many philanthropic and cultural causes. Together with his father, Captain Panayotis Tsakos, he is the co-founder of the Maria Tsakos Foundation International Center of Maritime Research and Tradition, which is named after his late sister, Maria. The Maria Tsakos Foundation is a charitable organization financing the well-being and education of young, talented men and women focusing on maritime studies and traditions in their native island of Chios and abroad. Now, our discussion is going to focus on three main themes, a brief trip down memory lane, then focus on today for the tanker industry and TAN, and then a look ahead, a look forward for the industry's direction and outlook. So let's welcome Dr. Nikos and begin our conversation. Thank you, Nick. You didn't tell me uh, I should be wearing a tie. I, I thought this would be an audio-only situation, so <laughs> at least I, I brought the jacket. And uh, well, it's it's great to be back uh, in in New York. It's been uh, a very long time with uh, the virus effect. It's the longest time I haven't visited uh, New York since my college age. So it's very nice to be here, and thank you for the opportunity to. Well, as you know, we came out with, uh, with our, our results uh, earlier today, and it's a nice opportunity also to reach out uh, to our friends and shareholders here in the United States and uh, around the world. And um, yeah, maybe, please, uh, I haven't done a, a podcast before, so this is the first time for everything. Thank you. And by the way, I, I, I remember from your acceptance speech uh, that, uh, you know, the awards night, but you mentioned uh, how much New York has been part of your life uh, and, your, and your history. So it's always great to have you back. So let me ask, obviously you come from a big shipping family and the question how you got into shipping is kind of self-explanatory, but still there is always a background, there is always a story. So please share with us how it all started, how it developed for yourself and please share with us some of your highlights as well as your family's highlights in terms of history and involvement uh, with shipping? Well, uh, as you know, we come from the island, as you said, from of Hughes, where if you are not a captain or an engineer or a seafarer, uh, you are considered a failure in life. But, uh, uh, my late grandmother, who lived up to be 100, and we lost her uh, around uh, 2001. She was uh, always uh, looking uh, whenever we introduce her to our guests in the island of Hughes, be it lawyers, uh, bankers, starters. Uh, she would ask, are they, are they a captain? Are they an engineer? Are they a seafarer? If I said, if we said no, she would look down at them. So this is the mentality of the little, I no, not little, of the island of Hughes uh, in, in the AGNC. Uh, uh, so it has been natural for our family to be in the business. We traced the first Chakos vessels uh, in the mid-1800s, 1854 to be, to be exact, the John Chakos and then the uh, Archangel. At the time, the vessels uh, were, um, they, they, they were uh, uh, sailed vessels with sails. And what, uh, they were not more than 100 feet. And what would happen was the, the Tsakos family of the time, our great, great, great grand uh, uncles and, and fathers, would actually man the ship uh, themselves. Uh, and uh, it was just a vehicle for them to trade. So we were not really, uh, we were ship owners uh, by need and not ship owners by trade. What uh, the, our predecessors usually did would uh, go and uh, fill up the vessel with um, citrus fruit that, uh, that's plenty and very nice in the island of, of Hughes. Uh, and uh, they would take those all the way in the Black Sea where there was a huge lack 
of vitamin C and, and, and uh, the citrus, or oranges, mandarins, lemons. And they would bring back from the Black Sea, which would be either Odessa or Romania, Costanza, grain, which was in, in a big demand in the, uh, in the Rocky Island we come from. So that, that was really what the main trades uh, our family started, uh, because the weather usually was not uh, always very good. There would be every time a ship uh, and a knock on wood, you know, knock on wood would be lost, the family members would have to work on somebody else's ship until they collected money to, you know, to buy their own ship again, and and that's uh, you know that's how uh, the it went on. Uh, the current state of our company was uh, was founded in the late 60s by my father, Captain Panagiotis Sakos, who made his initial fortune in oil trading. So you know he still maintains very much even in in, in today his trading. Uh, characteristics and attitudes much more than uh, you know just a, a, a traditional ship owner. So I would say that um, the initial seed uh, of of what uh, became the Chacos Group in the late sixties was based on the oil trading uh, at the time. And, uh, with the closure of uh, of the Suez Canal, uh, uh, there were opportunities that happened. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think we started the, the Chacos group in, in the late 60s. Uh, I was educated in, uh, in the United States. Uh, I joke sometimes, I said that I, I was accepted in various colleges at the time. One of them was on the West Coast. Uh, so if I had gone in the West Coast uh, by, you know, I think uh, uh, my future would have been very, very different uh, being uh, a high-tech trillionaire by now, or rather than a hard-working seafarer. Well, clearly, Nikos, it has been a very long and very distinguished um, career for the family and for yourself. You are one of the major uh, global shipping groups. Um, but can you share with us a few milestones in your career as a ship owner and also as an industry statesman? Yes, uh, as, as I said, the uh, I was, uh, I started visiting ships from a very young age. I think my father uh, had a very good uh, way to introduce me in the business without ever uh, pushing me or my late sister into the business, which I think that was that was very successful. And I tried to do the same with my son and my two daughters, uh, because um, it he, he never came out, although I was just the two of us, Maria and myself, he never uh, pushed me out. My mother uh, was and still is a, a very successful uh, doctor, as she was a cardiologist, uh, performing her duties. So I could have um, been a doctor instead. Uh, and uh, what the, the advice my father gave us around the dinner table was, uh, I don't care what you do, you can be a, a you know you can be a rock a rock sinker, you're a sinker, you can be an artist, you can be anything you want to be, but be the best or one of the best. I mean, do something in which you will enjoy being good at. Uh, don't just be mediocre. So. I have to say that really this, this freed me significantly. So when I came to, to study, at, I was around 17 in the United States, I had a, a, free, a free mind. I never felt the pressure that I had to, you know, to follow up anybody's footsteps. Uh, the reason we all love the United States and, and New York is because there are opportunities, uh, you know, as long as you work hard uh, and you believe in something, uh, you will succeed. And this is still, still, still is the, the land of opportunity. And uh, that's why, as, as I said, New York is a place I will, I encourage my children also to spend a lot of time and their studies, their studies here. Uh, he actually, I mean, he planted the seed of shipping because I worked on ships from a young age. Not as young as my son. I sent my son to sea at 11. Uh, I mean, I, I think I was in uh, around 15 when I started spending summers on board, quite a few of them. 
to be comfortable on, on the actual day-to-day -day life at sea and uh, the basic technical understandings of, of the ship. Uh, so when uh, when I I graduated with my you know I had a, a passion uh, and I felt comf comfortable with being on a ship and at sea, but uh, also I wanted to combine my my academic uh, knowledge and, and my you know, love for for the United States and New York, and that's how the whole idea about being the first publicly listed company on the U.S. stock exchange uh, actually came. And, I have to say, my father was uh, uh, not enthusiastically supportive as he uh, about public companies. He still looks at the public companies uh, with a lot of uh, uh, disbelief, uh, even today, uh, because of the time and effort that someone needs to to run a corporate structure, uh, as we did. I grew up in this corporate structure from a very very. So I do not know how to work else, you know, in a different with a different method. But uh, he he never he you know he, he said, and I was 24 at the time. So it's not uh, uh, said if you think this can be done and you want to do it, uh, you know, go ahead and do it. So so I have to say he 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 must uh, he is a, a genius in psychology, in actually you know guiding you towards what uh, you know on, on something he would like to do without you ever feeling that. Uh, you, 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 you had to do it. And I hope I'll be able to give this opportunity to my children too. Well, Nikos, I remember crossing paths with you in a way um, at City University Business School with our uh, beloved professor that we are both uh, fans of. Uh, and I remember that you, you reared off and you started uh, 10. So 10 is your baby, it's your creation. And uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, you grew that uh, company from four vessels to 71 vessels today. Tell us a little bit more about them, about the growth, the success, the challenges. Well, I, 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 I didn't want to say that you were a professor of mine because you're still very, very young and people will get the, the wrong idea about, about uh, your age. But it, it is true that uh, uh, the, the pool of inspiration of, I, I have to say that uh, when I was here in, in, the, in the mid to late 80s in, in the United States, the, the fashionable business uh, model for real estate were limited partnerships. And I think uh, if you look back, um, uh, that was the first time that uh, private building owners around the city started getting more and more into struct structured investments into actual real estate. And since we always look at shipping as you know floating real estate, I felt that that could be a model uh, to work to work for our for our industry. And uh, so it has to, you know it was inspired here, it, in basically in New York by studying uh, in, uh, in my, at Columbia University how the structures of the uh, uh, <coughs> partnerships were working for real estate. And then of course uh, it was uh, much more. Uh, you know, uh, industry specific by Professor Gramenos and uh, Mr. Stopford and your good selves uh, at the, in the city of London, but where you know, shipping is still a very, very much more important core, core part of, of business and academia. So coming out of those and uh, having time to think about all these things in one of my best milestone periods of life, which was uh, serving the Greek Navy, and I'm not joking, I think that was one of the most uh, relaxing and enjoyable parts of our life, together with college, of course. Uh, I came out with the idea uh, with, uh, with uh, following uh, what I had learned in academia and combining it in, into the family business. Quite uh, a start, and anyway, looking at the development, quite uh success story but let's go I, now i still believe i should have moved to the west coast this is <laughs> i'm glad you didn't nicholas because i think the shipping industry and greece need you for what you're doing today <laughs> yeah. anyway so let's talk about intertanker 
I mean, you uh, were at the helm of this organization. It's the industry organization for the tanker for tankers for four years. You were elected twice. That indicates your acceptance by your peers and your standing in the industry. Tell us a little bit about your tenure there, about the issues, the, the problems, um, about how you see the role of intertanker in the wider spectrum of uh, the shipping industry. Well, I, I believe that our industry is uh, very, very fragmented. And uh, I think uh, an organization like Intertanko puts a lot of time and effort to bring members closer together, uh, setting the challenges of, of a very complicated industry and uh, in, in a world that, that is ever changing. So I have to say that uh, I, I have been a very uh, big supporter of uh, uh, owners communicating. I'm a big supporter of pools. I, I believe that uh, a pooling arrangement of your uh, commercial strategy is always uh, successful. Uh, so, and it is something that you do not have, you do not have to merge. You do not have to carry the, you know, the luggage or the, you know, the skeletons in the closet of another public company. You do not have to spend, uh, and I'm sorry to say this for our friends, to our good friends at Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan, huge fees for doing something, you can have almost a very, very similar effect by just pulling your ships, uh, you know, in, in, uh, with owners. So uh, Intertanko uh, gave this uh, opportunity for owners to actually, you know, pull ideas together. And that's, uh, I, I found I was very proud to, to be part of that. I'm still very involved with, uh, with Intertanko. Uh, it, it's a pity that, uh, well, like in everything, but since 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 I left uh, since I left Intertanko, uh, our, our very good and capable chairman has not been able to, to to have us together face to face because that's when the virus happened. So we've been actually you know zooming each other. I hope that by by the April event of Intertanko this year, we will be able to have an event in London where we can all see each other since I I left the chairmanship. Because we are looking at so many pressing uh, uh, issues for ship owners. I mean, decarbonization is, is one very, very new technologies is, is, is the other one. And you know, we have to at least be able to exchange ideas. Well, you, you took us now to the next uh, uh, vertical of our, uh, of our discussion. Let's talk about the industry. And you mentioned decarbonization. One of the key topics when it comes to decarbonization is the regulatory direction. Uh, we see everybody would like to have uh, an international uh, regulatory framework applicable everywhere, but we see that this may not be the case, and you may end up having a number of regional uh, initiatives. So, what does this mean for, for a ship owner like yourself? I mean, this must be one of the major uncertainties you're facing in terms of uh, the regulatory framework that you have to comply with. It, it is true. It, it is true. But I think we have to put things into perspective. We all uh, have to strive for our children. And our, actually, our children and our uh, you know younger people are, are pushing us very, very much, and rightly so, to to, to, to give them a, a, a greener planet, or at least not <laughs> not not, uh, not a much worse planet than the one our parents uh, handed to us. So I think this is an obligation we have. Putting it in perspective, shipping has been, uh, and it's something that it's very hard to, uh, unfortunately, to uh, communicate with the public is, is uh, putting it in, in brackets, one of the greenest, if not the greenest method of moving vast quantities of, uh, of goods. Because, uh, I mean, we are, give or take, uh, responsible for 3% of the carbon out there, but we actually move more than 70% of what has to be moved uh, around the world. So this is something which is missed. I'm not saying that uh, because of that, we should not be doing anything. We should, should be doing a much, much more, but I think we should be able to uh, to educate the uh, the press 
and, and, and the public about uh, the huge and the vital role of, uh, of shipping in the world and how environmental, uh, you know, economical and efficient it is. I mean, can you imagine having to move, uh, uh, you know, 200,000 uh, tons of, of oil, um, you would need uh, 200,000 trucks uh, to move around, which would create a humongous pollution uh, to the world of, of what we're doing. So having said that, uh, uh, I think the industry is there to, uh, as we announced today, we're starting with our dual fuel vessels. We are there to do the utmost to, to achieve our target by 2030 and 2050. You took me to the next question. Now, besides the regulatory uh, framework, you also have uh, the question on the fuels of the future. I think there are a number of options, none of them, I mean, they are all in development, but in the meantime, LNG seems to be an option that many owners, including yourself, uh, tend to adopt, uh, not, probably not only as a, an intermediate interim solution, but maybe for the longer term. So tell us a little bit about exactly how you see the future of, your, of the future developing and, uh, and the LNG in particular that you have uh, opted for yourself. Well, I, I think LNG is a very good step forward. Uh, it has uh, its uh, limitations. I think technology is coming close in capturing these limitations, capturing the methane slip, as we say, and reducing it further and further. Uh, that I think very similarly, the existing uh, the existing fuels. Uh, the oil companies and the refiners should make a, a bigger effort than they do in capturing carbon in those two, because I think it can be done, and it can be done with a fraction of the disruption and the investment that you need uh, when we're talking about the hydrogen, nuclear, or, or, or something, something different. So I think uh, we could navigate into a common uh, an acceptable new source of energy up to two, uh, 2050 uh, by putting more focus than we do today on making sure that uh, the LNG and the existing fuels get uh, decarbonized uh, and used in the infrastructure that exists. Because I think one thing which is missing, and I, I don't know if they're going to talk about it, uh, uh, in, 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 in Scotland uh, next uh, next month uh, is the actual damage of, to our planet to achieve the new infrastructure <laughs> that will move what would be supposedly a much more green uh, energy. Uh, in order, I mean, we have an infrastructure which is huge. You have the refineries, you have the pipelines, you have the LNG, you know, starting to have an infrastructure. If you want to mimic or build this, the environmental effect, uh, negative effect, will be huge. So whereas we should be looking for the future, we should not, we should not only be looking to the future just to, be, to sound futuristic. We have to be pragmatic and protect the planet from, uh, from uh, things uh, that might. we're talking about. Electric. I mean, you know, I, I, I love hybrid cars. I love electric cars. But no one uh, sits and uh, and says, uh, guys, yes, okay. But all this electricity we're plugging in the car, it's very good. Who is producing? Where is the electricity produced? It is produced somewhere. So it, you know, we need to we need to look at the whole chain of events and not just the final result because you have to start from zero from the first part of the chain to the last. And then that's and, and add all the the damage to the environment and just not to focus on the last one. Indeed. So let's go to the next uh, topic. Uh, you are known for your passion and commitment to uh, operational excellence, to ship safety and security, and to the well being of your seafarers. You actually made a big. Uh, a mention of that uh, in your earnings call today. So tell us about uh, 
what is going on in that in that area while uh, progress has been made in terms of the crew changes the plight of crews on board still continues the crisis is not over yet so how can this be resolved now and also set a kind of uh, a solution that can remain for the longer term well Nick, i think that that's uh, that's that's a very very good point and i think that was uh, uh if if we went back two years or 18 months uh, and we knew what we know today I, we should have done things very very different as far as our shippers is concerned i think we let them down and i don't think we let them down in as an industry, we didn't let them down uh, intentionally, uh, but uh, uh, w w there are about 400,000 seafarers in the world. That's the size of the small village in China or India, or uh, or or the size of uh, not even uh, you know. Half the size of Salonica or Volo, you know. So I'm putting it in perspective, it's not a huge amount of people. If we had a unified vote and we knew what we know today, we should have vaccinated all those 400,000 people immediately. And we should not have allowed, and of course, you couldn't do the people that are on board the ships, but we should not ha have allowed a single seafarer after March, April 2020 to board the ship unvaccinated. I think this I consider a breakdown and a failure of, uh, of the way we treated our people, because then we would be able to have them uh, move much more freely around uh, the world uh, rather than being hostages in their own ships and not seeing their family. So, uh, if, if I would uh, have to go back and do something, uh, you know, in the last uh, say 20 months, that would have been something I feel very passionate. And we're doing this in our company. We started doing it as early as possible. Uh, I think it would, you know, it would have cost nothing to come up with uh, you know, half a million, uh, uh, you know, Johnson and Johnson, Pfizer, or you know, whatever such. Perhaps the Johnson and Johnson being the single one would have been the, the easier solution. And I'm sure all, all you know, it will be it, anyway. So the, I, I think uh, things are getting better, but uh, we had a, a major <laughs> breakdown, and of course we were we were caught uh, and surprised. That's why we did this. Uh, right now, I mean, we're talking about digitaliz digitalization. We're talking about uh, progress and automatization, but uh, I, I do not believe that either my or my children's generation will um, uh, will uh, uh, live through the completely humanless uh, automated vessel and uh, navigation. I think you will need the perhaps less and highly trained uh, seafarers for at least the ocean going vessels. There might be cases when, when you have a, you know, a, a specific close route or a coastal route, you could try something like that, but I think you will always need men and women to be able to take uh, care of uh, safe navigation. Well, thank you for this very, uh, very spot on comments, uh, Nikos. I think though that uh, the, the issue with the vaccine, you know, the, the vaccination uh, to some extent had also to do with the availability and the timing of, of vaccines, because at the beginning, I think the supply was uh, a bit tougher. And I know that uh, a number of uh, most companies, including yourself at the forefront, are now, uh, have now implemented full vaccination uh, programs and are, and are putting a lot of emphasis on that. And anyway, part I think of, the, of dealing with seafarers uh, is also maritime education. And that is a key factor uh, so that the younger generation can be attracted and opt for a seafaring career. Your, uh, you and your father with the uh, Maria Tsakos Foundation named uh, after your late sister, you are putting a lot of uh, effort and focus exactly on maritime education. Can you please tell us a little bit more about it? The work you do is 
far-reaching and pioneering? Uh, well, uh, I, I have to say that uh, my father's passion for uh, for the seafarers, which has been also uh, transmitted down to, to the next generations, uh, is is vast. Don't forget, he's a captain. He has uh, uh, lived uh, most of his life uh, feeling that he, as, as soon as he became a captain, that that's uh, that's his main title. And, uh, and uh, as I said, we, I, we do not expect to be living in an automated world. Uh, our aim is to educate uh, top quality students into navigating the ships of the, of the future. Uh, uh, we, we strongly believe that uh, uh, sea captains and, uh, and, and airline pilots, uh, both of them move a significant part of, of the world and they have very vital roles. Uh, and, and we see more and more that uh, shipping uh, the shipping of the officers will be developing and be specialized very much and very similar to the to the airline industry model. So you you would have very very highly educated people uh, that will be running our ships, and uh, this will happen uh, to countries because most of the seafarers, uh, for better or the worse, do not come anymore from European or, or North American. Uh, uh, countries we have a vast pool of seafarers, uh, top quality or, and top characteristics here from the Philippines. We have a vast quality from China. We have a vast quality from India. Uh, quite a pool of seafarers in the ex-Soviet Union countries, uh, Ukraine and, uh, and, uh, and and Russia, uh, down to less than twenty thousand in Greece from one hundred and fifty. Uh, uh, back in the 60s when my father was at sea. Uh, and we try to, they're very, very important. Uh, I mean, we, we can go as we do and order uh, the highest quality and specification vessel costing 200 plus million dollars uh, to purchase. But uh, 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 if you do not have a, a, a man or a woman who can navigate that ship, then it, uh, it, it is wrong actually building a ship. So let's move on now to uh, your views on the tanker industry. Obviously, you have a unique uh, and deep insight in that. Um, we have seen uh, supply chain uh, disruptions affecting many other sectors, the container sector, the dry bulk. Have they affected the tanker industry? And now we are also coming closer to the winter time, uh, usually a period of heightened activity for the tanker industry. So are we likely to see more disruptions? Well, I, I think the, the the oil industry uh, the oil industry uh, moved uh, preemptively into covering its needs of uh, as soon as the pandemic uh, really started hitting us in uh, in uh, March uh, April 2020. And, uh, you 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 remember the the huge demand for tanker services. I mean, I remember walking, uh, because sometimes we couldn't go to the office at the time, so I was taking long walks around the, the Acropolis and the Parthenon uh, with, my, you know, with my colleagues in order to keep a <laughs> same state of mind during the first lockdown. And my phones, our phones were ringing for uh, you know, people, uh, oil companies asking for uh, at any price for ships. So what happened? And the tankers is between March and uh, and uh, Christmas of 2020. Uh, we enjoyed uh, so about a year ago. We enjoyed a very very strong market uh, and uh, inventories and, and the oil uh, the oil uh, depots got filled with with inven with uh, inventory. Uh, uh, what happened after that? Uh, we we had the, or during that time we had a big disruption of movement around the world. I mean, don't forget that uh, still most of the airports or the airlines are, are grounded. Uh, New York, although it's moving, it's moving like, uh, like it is a lazy Sunday day every day, which actually is quite pleasant 
avoiding too much traffic, uh, but it doesn't, doesn't help the tanker industry. And, and still the weather is, is quite warm. Uh, these inventories uh, are now being depleted. Uh, we have calls uh, of, uh, I would say, of agony from uh, big uh, nations like China about having to get as much energy as possible, as soon as possible at any cost. Uh, the same is happening with gas. We have uh, uh, Russian gas uh, and the Russian authorities saying that they will assist in this. So I, I think we are back. Uh, we had one year to deplete what was actually a build up back uh, in, uh, in 2020. And the world, uh, now we will be seeing the, the double whammy where we have uh, the world waking up again and depleted inventories. So I think we are not far from uh, a significant strengthening in the market. The first signs are out there. And let's hope uh, you know, that our markets will follow those of containers and dry cargo. I think it is inevitable to happen, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. Well, you know, from what I hear also from uh, the other industry experts, the analysts, uh, the, the general consensus is that exactly the, the tanker sector is the next one to recover, and hopefully that recovery is, uh, is imminent. Uh, but what you described uh, was more on the demand side. I have the, uh, the, the, uh, the conviction that also the supply side uh, is adding to this recovery because we have a large part of the fleet being old. You have the, all these environmental regulations that uh, do not favor the older ships. So besides the demand, what else do you see as a driver uh, for the recovery of the shipping industry, the tanker industry? Well, well, I think, I, you know, I have always been saying during my intertanko tenor that uh, what really kills our industry or brings the rates down is the oversupply of tonnage and uh, that's why I, I was always promoting people not to build ships for for the wrong reasons it seems uh, you know the world finally is coming into a, a recognition when i say for the wrong reasons but there might be the right reasons is that no one knows what type of ships uh, to build so i mean we took the decision we will not build any more conventional uh, tankers the way we know them, unless they are at least, uh, I mean, talking about new building ships. So we will not spend money for the future into conventional assets because we believe that uh, things will change in the future. Uh, we have already uh, ordered uh, up to six uh, double fuel vessels. So we announced today in, in our results. So, and, and so it's logical, people are not building because they do not know what technology they're going to build. And unless you have a contract that covers uh, this, the first mover disadvantage is huge because the people who will build ships today uh, without employment, they take the risk that in three or four or five years, technology will have moved so much forward that the assets that they would spend a fortune for uh, to be depreciated over 25 years uh, will, uh, will already be depreciated because of the change of technology. So that's, well, that's why we do not have supply and that's why we, you know, that's another factor for a, for a better market. Well, I re remember two of your statements, uh, one on the prudent growth, which has to do exactly with not speculative growth, ordering ships that have no employment, and the other famous one that you have put, uh, you have mentioned in one of the Catalan forums, you were addressing your um, your panelists. You said, uh, "Happen to be, uh, you know, so please put your pens in your pockets, um, so that exactly people would not go out and order speculatively, uh, you know, new ships." But let me ask you: you, you mentioned about the. Um, the new technologies, uh, what you are doing as a group uh, for uh, greener shipping. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you as a group are doing overall uh, in terms of the renewables and uh, the green, uh, green era, green energy? Well, I, I mean, it is obvious that all our, uh, our top tier clients are uh, spending a lot of uh, R&D 
into into renewable energy. Uh, so it is uh, uh, there uh, for us uh, as part of the chain of energy, the energy chain, to to look at uh, similar uh, opportunities. Uh, so we are actually investing in uh, a lot of uh, renewable energy through photovoltaics. Uh, as you might know, our family is a big uh, uh, a big landowner uh, in, in South America of, uh, of forests and uh, eucalyptus trees. Uh, and so we are actually uh, increasing significantly that part of our business. Uh, uh, the family has moved into South America back in the early 70s. And uh, we are replacing a lot of our cow land uh, into um, uh, actually more and more uh, eucalyptus uh, trees, which I think uh, it's very positive for, for the environment. Uh, and we are uh, right now the investors in perhaps one of the largest uh, photovoltaic projects in Europe. Uh, and all this in order to keep the balance uh, and follow the lead of our of our largest clients. Interesting. And quite pioneering. But staying on the same topic, let, let me ask you, everybody talks today about the greener economy. And uh, I think when we talk about the greener economy, the perception created to everybody is that uh, this is going to happen tomorrow. And actually, it will take a long time before it happens. The trend may be there, but it will take time. So as we go into a greener economy, do you expect demands for oil and products to decrease with, and what would be the impact to the tanker market? Well, uh, all you have to look is uh, look at the example of coal. It, it was uh, five years ago. We were, we, we all uh, you know waved goodbye and uh, feeling that that was the end of the coal era. Today the prices of coal are at the highest for 15 years, and uh, there's a huge coal production and consumption in in in, in uh, uh, you know, countries uh, like like Germany, and of course China. So I think if coal is still playing a significant role in the, into the uh, energy chain, um, the oil oil will continue. And if the oil companies uh, spend a little bit more into research and development of actually capturing a lot of its uh, of its negative features, I think it will continue to play a significant role role going going forward. So. Uh, I, I do. We have been uh, moving uh, the peak oil uh, dates from it was, it was supposed to be in 2010, then it was 2020. Now the last one I saw was in 2036. But again, uh, this is uh, don't forget we have vast uh, countries. The future actually of the world are countries like Africa, where uh, I, I think. Uh, the, the development of Africa could be, uh, as a con as a huge continent, as a diversified continent, could be one day similar to what uh, the world uh, experienced with the development of, of, of China, uh, which within one generation, uh, one, one's lifetime, even less, one generation has, uh, from uh, an agricultural based economy has become one of the powerhouse industrial and uh, commercial uh, forces in the world. And, and uh, we have uh, also vast countries like India that are really uh, somewhere in between that and, and Africa. So I think I think to not to say too much, uh, it, the oil the oil uh, the oil companies uh, are, are looking at the renewables they're doing that very well. Uh, but they should invest more and more in actually capturing uh, the the carbon effects of of the existing uh, fuels uh, in order to maintain at least until 2050 when we're ready for something new. Thank you, uh, Nikos. We have had uh, a great discussion. We're approaching the end of our uh, of our podcast. Uh, just a couple more questions. 
more on the personal side, I know that you know you are a major industry participant. You have been a globe trotter, you know, traveling all the time. Not lately, but you know this is coming back. So, how do you manage family, business, friends uh, moving all over the world, and uh, you know being on the alert twenty four seven? How do you balance all that? Well, uh, I mean, I I was uh, I was uh, I would say uh, quite. I started my my family in my late thirties which had given me plenty of time to put the boat on course of business. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I do not regret doing it that way. Uh, so with, uh, with uh, Celia's help and, uh, and, and, the, and the three children, and also we have been blessed to still have uh, both my parents uh, who Spend a lot of time with the, with the grandchildren when Celia and I travel. So I think it's uh, it's one of the blessings in, in life. And my late mother-in-law, who just passed away three years ago, she was uh, actually living with us, and uh, she brought up for my kids. My son is now 19. My two daughters are 17. Almost almost uh, uh, out, uh, out of the of the woods. Uh, two 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 more enjoyable years with the kids at home before we become uh, empty nesters, uh, as they say. Uh, so it's been, a, it's been a very, very nice journey uh, with uh, Celia's uh, help. We, we have enjoyed immensely, uh, have relieved our youth through our children. Uh, we have been to every single uh, sports event around the world with them, academic events. So, uh, you know, w w when someone tells you <laughs> that uh, you know, enjoy your kids because uh, time goes very fast. It's not really, <laughs> it's not really true. It is, it is enjoyable, but uh, we, we spend a lot of time. We are, we are a very close family. And I think that that's my priority. And uh, I am glad that I, I was able to, to develop my business uh, earlier. And I will be hopefully still be under 60 which uh, uh, when everybody's out of the house uh, to, to start my second career. So that, <laughs> but, uh, I'm looking forward to that, uh, to that too. And uh, to, that will be the greener time for 10, uh, very, very timely. So when I, well, we, uh, we, leave, uh, we leave for Poland, I will be 59 and uh, yeah, ready to go again. Well said, Nicholas. So last concluding question. Uh, after building such a successful career, if you look back at your younger self, anything you would have done differently, any advice you would give to your younger self or to the younger generation who are starting out their career? Well, you know, as I said, I'm not joking when I tell you I should have gone, when I, when I, I was accepted in a uh, few universities uh, in the UK and here, mostly in the on the, on the on the east coast, uh, but plus UCLA on the west coast, and uh, I went to visit, and I have to say I was very impressed. But uh, I guess both me and my parents felt it was a, a bit too far away from Greece to move to the west coast. Uh, but uh, yes, I, I would I would like them to to consider that the world is their oyster, uh, that they should not uh, that, that that there is nothing they cannot achieve. Uh, in in any segment, and uh, as I said, uh, I was uh, uh, glad not to have uh, a family pressure uh, to do to to enter the family business. And I was able to do it in a completely different. I mean, by maintaining, of course, the same business, and the same operations, and the same traditions, uh, and the same way we run our business. But at least, uh, you know take it uh, many, many corporate steps different from, from where I found it. And I do not regret that. I, because I think as we, the more the world changes, the more the corporate structure and the culture that I naturally have uh, to work uh, is going to be very, very useful. So yeah, I, I wish they came to, to, to my children to, uh, to, to feel the same way, not to feel the pressure. I actually joke with my son. He's a, 
okay, football player, so Panagiotis, if you if you became Ronaldo or Messi, I wouldn't tell you to stop and, and come into shipping. Thank you very much for a great discussion, uh, both on the personal side, on the business side, the industry side. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I will conclude our, uh, our discussion also by saying it's a privilege to know you and work with you. And uh, of course, to thank you for all the support and the faith you have given to Capitalink over the years. Um, it is a particular honor to be able to have this discussion with you today. So I'd like to thank you. I'd like to also remind uh, our audience that uh, DNV uh, is sponsoring this podcast today. And they have made a big commitment to the Greek market with uh, being there for over a hundred years. So I'd like to thank them for this. And Nico, again, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much for, you know, I, I hope people were able to stay awake for so long. That's one of the longest interviews I've ever given in, in, <laughs> in my business career. Uh, and again, uh, thank you for the efforts that uh, you have put into promoting uh, this, uh, this industry, which uh, needs a lot of uh, as much promotion as, as, uh, as possible. Thank you. Thank you.